Rujit, we can start. Okay. So, good evening, everyone present in the meeting and those who are joining us from Facebook. So, a very good evening to all of you. In our today's weekly seminar, we have uh, Rajesh Venkata Subramaniam with us, who is an associate professor and the head of the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences in Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research, Mohali, Punjab. He is, he is the author of Manuscripts, Memory and History, Classical Tamil Literature in Colonial India, published by Foundation Books, New Delhi in 2014. His current research interests are progressive literary movement, movement uh, in Tamil and the intellectual history of various strands of left in Tamil Nadu. So without further ado, I would like um, uh, Professor Rajesh to, you know, just uh, go on with this talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Arijit. Uh, we would like to welcome Professor Rajesh uh, to the Department of History and its weekly Wednesday uh, seminar series. And we are really looking forward to your talk because, you know, it's a very interesting uh, topic where we are, I, I hope we're going to, we are going to learn a lot more about how, um, how literature and other um, epistemies were uh, created uh, or recreated during the colonial period. And I'm sure we'll have a lot of questions for you after the talk, but um, uh, we, we are really looking forward to this talk, uh, Dr. Rajesh Pinkat Subramaniam. So please go ahead so that you know our audience can participate. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Raj Rajesh. Yeah, so uh, uh, good evening all. Uh, First, I would like to begin by thanking Professor Seema Bhava and the seminar committee, Department of History, Delhi University, for giving me an opportunity to share my research work and concerns with the audience here. The title of my talk is From Rediscovery to Reproduction, Classical Tamil Literature in Colonial India. I hope you are able to see my screen. Uh, in yes, front of yes, you. we can, we can. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, let me begin by introducing the uh, title. Uh, the title carries a couple of, uh, you know, uh, 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 topics. Um, now, what do I mean by classical Tamil literature? What are the texts that I'm uh, going to refer to in this talk? The earliest stratum of Tamil literature is often referred to as Sangam literature or early Tamil poetry comprising eight anthologies, Ettu Togai, Ten Songs, Patu Patu, and Grammar Tolkapiyam. Containing over 2,000 lyrical poems of varying lengths, they are dated to the early centuries of the common era. There are beautiful translations of these uh, poems available in English. Uh, you can consult uh, A.K. Ramanujan's uh, uh, translations. Uh, in uh, uh, the poems of love and war and interior landscape. Referred to as Sandror Cheyul or the poetry of the noble ones in the Tamil commentarial tradition, the classics were handed down in tradition until the 19th century when they were put into printed editions. Beginning with the publication of one of the eight anthologies, Kalit in 1887, all the Sangam literary works were printed before 1920. Now, my, the title of my talk also carried two other uh, conceptual uh, categories, rediscovery and reproduction. Now, what I mean by rediscovery is a historiographical perspective, conveying the idea that there was a hiatus for a couple of centuries, that is from the 17th to the early 19th century in the study and transmission of classics, largely due to Hindu Shaiva sectarian bias in Tamil literature. The 19th century, the historiography argued, saw the dramatic rediscovery of classics with the coming of print, and a few Tamil pundits were credited for their role in the rediscovery. 
now i will go through uh, 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 representative writings that uh, pitch this idea of rediscovery of classics um, the inherent assumption in this usage of the concept rediscovery is that uh, there was a hiatus or a break in the study and transmission of classics uh, from the 17th to the early 19th century and the reason for this uh, break uh, is, is attributed to the hindu shaiva sectarian bias in tamil literature and that uh, in the 19th century with the coming of print there was a dramatic rediscovery uh, of uh, the ancient sangam literature and in this story of rediscovery few tamil pandits were credited for their role uh, in reconstituting uh, this ancient literary corpus in the colonial period now this is a valid historiographical perspective uh, many scholars have written about it and uh, uh, there is a validity to it and uh, you know uh, so this is one way of looking at it but what i am appealing and i have been writing on this uh, topic for a while is that i am uh, 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 it, it would be productive to move away from this uh, conceptual understanding of rediscovery to that of reproduction uh, so that is what i am going to uh, argue in this talk i am going to first uh, you know introduce to you a host of writings that uh, talk about uh, the rediscovery of uh, classics in the colonial period and in the second part of my talk i will discuss about uh, the need to move away from this perspective to look at uh, the uh, to use uh, you know the concept of reproduction Uh, and uh, while doing so we also in the process uh, account for uh, the histories of transmission of classics the issues i will come uh, in a short while now there is a book length study i have done uh, this is part of my doctoral research subsequently revised and published in 2014 uh, by foundation books if you are interested in looking at uh, a book length study of this uh, topic you can uh, look at my book manuscripts memory and history classical tamil literature in colonial india now the reproduction of classical tamil literature during the 19th and early 20th century occupy an important chapter in the history of tamil literature of the modern period facilitated partly by the expansion of an access to printing technology during the 19th century the classical tamil literary heritage un- underwent a transformation from the medium of palm leaf manuscripts to printed books spearheaded by a few tamil pandits with active patronage from hindu religious sectarian monasteries and a nascent vernacular middle class the publication of classical tamil literature engendered a new literary and cultural consciousness in tamil speaking districts of the madras presidency the subject therefore has received considerable scholarly attention among social and literary historians we will in a short while look at the arguments presented by uh, the strand of historiography now how this uh, you know rediscovery or reconstitution of uh, uh, ancient tamil literature in the colonial period was conceptualized uh, in the history writing and what what are the implications uh, in historiography Uh, it has been argued that the publication of classics resulted in tamil renaissance uh, a florescence of tamil literary and cultural sensibility uh, captured in the title of uh, an interesting book by nambi aruran in 1980 titled tamil renaissance and dravidian nationalism 1905 to 1944 now uh, the classics also is said to have provided uh an ideological legitimacy to the rise of the non brahman political movement in the early 20th century there are host of writings on the history of the rise of non brahman movement in uh, in tamil nadu uh, eugene irshik's uh, 1969 work uh, and also we, we have sumati ramaswamy and others uh, p geeta s v rajagurai mss pandian and others uh so uh, classics being secular uh in uh, uh nature uh is understood to have provided uh, uh you know an ideological dimension 
uh, to the rising non Brahman political uh, movement in the early 20th century. Also, uh, the uh, recovery of classics in the colonial period was also understood, uh, uh, you know, um, understood as uh, reconstituting a Tamil literary canon with accompanying secularization and linear notions of time in colonial Madras. And the concept that is often used by scholars to refer to this process is the rediscovery, uh, a rediscovery that resulted in the transformation of classics from palm leaf manuscript to printed uh, editions. And uh, the understanding was that the classics were forgotten for a couple of centuries only to be dramatically rediscovered during the 19th century, uh, as evident from uh, the writings of scholars like A.K. Ramanujan. I'll come to that uh, in a while. Now, what are the uh, limitations of the rediscovery argument? It is a valid historiographical perspective. I, I have no conflict with that. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, uh, it is my contention that it would be productive to uh, think about uh, this whole reconstitution uh, in the colonial period in terms of uh, a reproduction. I'll come to that, uh, you know, what, what, what uh, it means. The rediscovery of Tamil classics argument firmly anchors on privileging the autobiography of one of the foremost editors of classics of the late 19th and early 20th century, U. E. Swaminath Iyer, whose own self-perception of Tamil literary tradition is reproduced in the modern scholarly writings. Originally serialized in, pop, in the popular Tamil magazine, Ananda Vigadan, from 1940 to 1942, the autobiography of Swaminath Iyer is considered a valuable source of information by a generation of historians and Tamil scholars to examine the nature of the 19th century history of Tamil literature. Coupled with the biography that Swaminath Iyer authored of his teacher Mahavidwan Meenakshi Sundaram Pillai, these works have come to occupy an important place in literary histories. The rediscovery of Tamil classics argument is silent or at best ignores the history of the transmission of Tamil classics in Tamil literary tradition and history. It takes for granted the assumption that there was a hiatus in the study and transmission of classics before the 19th century. So uh, this is what I consider it as a limitation uh, of the rediscovery argument. This rediscovery argument stemmed from privileging uh, the autobiography of Swaminath Iyer. It's, a, it's an exhaustive account uh, of uh, uh, Swaminath Iyer's uh, experience in the Tamil literary and cultural world. Uh, and it provided inspiration for modern scholars, uh, literary scholars and historians to comment on the nature of Tamil literary culture during uh, the 19th century. It needs to be kept in mind that a large part of uh, Swaminath Iyer's autobiography deals with uh, the literary culture in the dominant Shaiva monastery called the Tiruvavadurai uh, monastery in Tamil Nadu. And uh, uh, so therefore, uh, you know, Norman Cutler uh, in his essay, Three Moments in the Genealogy of uh, Tamil Literary Culture, does talk about, uh, you know, uh, the basis of Swaminath Iyer's autobiography and the experiences that, uh, you know, uh, that, uh, you know, he recounts. So uh, this is one of uh, the things to keep in mind that a large part of autobi autobiography talks about the literary culture uh, of uh, the dominant Shaiva monastery in, in, in Tamil Nadu. Uh, so therefore, and secondly, uh, they were, uh, you know, recounted in the, almost in the mid 20th century uh, in a popular Tamil magazine, Ananda Vigadan, uh, from 1940 to 42. Uh, so therefore, in other words, uh, uh, a memoir that was presented in the mid 20th century becomes a source to comment and uh, discuss uh, the nature of Tamil literary culture of the 19th century. And so therefore it is my contention that it would be productive to look at uh, the 19th century source as well. And, uh, you know, uh, and uh, uh, look at this uh, question afresh uh, from, uh, you know, 
looking at multiplicity of text and not just relying solely on the autobiography of uh, uh, Swami Nadayar. Now, this is uh, uh, the latest critical edition of uh, uh, Swami Nadayar's autobiography published uh, uh, by one of the leading Tamil publishers. Um, it's called N. Charitram. Uh, so, however, while this this been the case, while rediscovery argument been the case in understanding the reconstitution of Tamil literary canon uh, in the 19th uh, uh, and early 20th century, the recent trends in historiography, uh, you know, has moved away uh, uh, from what it was in uh, 90s and uh, in 2000. There has been what is what I call a manuscript turn in Tamil literary studies. And this manuscript turn in Tamil literary studies have started to examine the nature of palm leaf manuscripts and therefore in the process looked at the transmission histories. Here I am referring to the works of Eva Wilden and her team of researchers at the Center for the Study of Manuscript Cultures at the University of uh, Hamburg uh, uh, in, in Germany. And also my own uh, work, uh, you know, post uh, uh, certain questions uh, uh, along these lines uh, in 2014. There have also been recently ethnographic studies on Tamil Jainas by Uma Mageshwari. There has been a studies on Ayodhidas Pandidar and Tamil Buddhism by Malarvari Jayant and Gajendra Nayadurai, and uh, 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 a series of writings on uh, Christian missionary uh, archives and Tamil literary studies by scholars like Will Sweetman, who published uh, uh, the catalog of uh, Ziegenball uh, called uh, Bibliotheca Malabarica, and a recent work by Margarita Trento on writing Tamil uh, Catholicism on C.J. Besky's uh, uh, literary compositions in Tamil. So, uh, so we have, uh, you know, the historiography has moved on. Um, and therefore, it is uh, necessary for us to under understand and recognize uh, these uh, changes that has happened in recent times. Now, before I go to the, uh, uh, the re reproduction argument, let me talk about uh, the earlier strand of historiography that uh, understood the uh, reconstitution of Tamil literary, ancient Tamil liter literature of the ancient Tamil literature in the 19th and early 20th century from the framework of uh, the rediscovery argument. I'm going to uh, review uh, these uh, uh, six, uh, you know, writings, uh, influential writings, uh, uh, brilliant uh, essays uh, by these uh, scholars. Um, they were an inspiration to me while growing up as a PhD student, uh, and they were really thought provoking. So I'm going to review these uh, six, uh, you know, uh, publications uh, and, uh, you know, and uh, talk about some of uh, the limitations. But before I do so, let me also, uh, you know, talk a little bit about uh, uh, the, uh, the assumptions. Now, underlying these varied interpretations of Tamil literary history is the changing nature of the source that historians and literary scholars have been examining over the years the hegemony wielded by Shaivism in Tamil history that had, that had come to determine what constituted Tamil literature and identity for several centuries in pre-modern times and whose influence had considerable role to play in the articulation of Tamil literary histories of the modern period. Notwithstanding the recognition of the plural nature of Tamil literary space in Tamil literary tradition by some scholars, Histories of Tamil literature continue to revolve around individuals and institutions associated with Shaivism in Tamil Nadu. The generic repetition of the term rediscovery to refer to the reproduction and publication of classical Tamil literature during the 19th century has become endemic to Tamil literary scholarship. This understanding, as I argued, firmly anchors on privileging the autobiography of Swaminath Iyer the late 19th and early 20th century editor of classical Tamil text, whose own self-perception of the Tamil literary tradition is reproduced in modern writings. Uh, while this is the case in the earlier uh, strand of historiography, relying on Swaminath Iyer's autobiographical accounts, 
the newly emerging st studies provide an alternative framework for understanding the 19th century reproduction of classical Tamil literature by marshalling and examining the palm leaf manuscripts that modern editors of classics used to publish the first printed editions. This has involved examining the nature of palm leaf manuscripts, their provenance, textual particularities, intertextuality, and so on. Such studies have allowed us to see the fascinating literary world of the Pullovers, Kavirayars, and Upadhyayars, and institutions beyond the orbit of dominant Shaivite monasteries in Tamil Nadu. While at, while at one level, this manuscript turn in the recent historiography of the 19th century Tamil literature has questioned the dramatization of the idea of rediscovery of classics and the role of print, it has also opened up a mosaic texture of social and cultural history going beyond the dominant individuals and institutions as objects of study. Now, with this uh, 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 you know, uh, summary of the two strands of uh, historiography, the earlier strand that uh, privileged uh, Swaminathaya's autobiography and talk, uh, talked about uh, the rediscovery of classics. In recent times, we have, there has been a turn, manuscript turn in literary studies, uh, a sensitivity to the transmission of uh, classics uh, is displayed. Now, let me uh, take up these, uh, uh, you know, a review of these six influential uh, writings and present to you the ideas that were, uh, you know, articulated. First, let me begin with A.K. Ramanujan's uh, uh, brilliant essay, Classics Lost and Found, uh, um, in his uh, collected essays. In an essay that examined tradition and modernity in the making of Tamil literature, Ramanujan observed, I quote, Indian tradition is not a single street or a one-way street, but consists of many connected streets and neighborhoods, like that town itself. And that interlocking and coexistent, though they are, people of one neighborhood may never have stepped into another, unquote. However, this recognition of the multiplicity of past did not prevent Ramanujan from considering solely the autobiographical account of Swaminathayar as the basis for commenting on the 19th century reproduction of classical Tamil literature. Referring to the Sangam text and the Tamil epic Silapadigaram and Manimegalai, Ramanujan observed that I quote, the story of the rediscovery of these great classical texts in the 19th century is a dramatic one, unquote. This understanding of reproduction as rediscovery in a dramatic sense is largely based on the account of Swaminathayar's autobiography. Noting that in Indian culture, the past lives on providing paradigms and ironies for the present, Ramanujan claimed that, I quote, the classical Tamil tradition was not always known to the Tamils themselves or actively present to them. In the 18th century, Hindu scholars, devout worshippers of Shiva and Vishnu, did not wish to read so-called non-religious poems and would not teach them to their pupils. The epic Silapadigaram and Manimegalai were non-Hindu. The latter was clearly Buddhist. So even the finest Tamil scholars of the time ignored these breathtaking epics and the anthologies of early Tamil, most did not even suspect their existence and gave their nights and days to religious and grammatical texts, many of which were of minor importance." Unquote. Citing Swaminathayar's encounter with Salem Ramasamy Mudaliyar, narrated in great detail in Iyer's autobiography, Ramanujan considered it a transformative moment not just in the life of Swaminathayar, but for Tamil culture. In another essay, Ramanujan made a similar observation. I quote, the great Sangam text of classical Tamil literature, including the eight anthologies of love and war poetry and the Silapadigaram, were entirely inaccessible to most scholars all through the early 19th century, though they were well known and commented upon in the early 80s. The 18th century Shaivite and Vaishnavite scholars, apparently tabooed as irreligious, all secular texts which included the earliest and the greatest of Tamil literary text. They disallowed from study all Jain and Buddhist texts, which included the great epic Silapadigaram. Under this intellectual taboo, a great scholar like Swaminathayar had to give his nights and days 
to second rate religious and grammatical text of the medieval period unquote such essentialist readings betray the diversity of literary traditions that ramanujan was referring to when pointing to swaminatha iyer's realization that is encounter uh, with the tamil jain community that the text unknown to him were read somewhere else similarly after editing uh, tirumurugattar padai swaminatha iyer is said to have witnessed the recitation of the same text by the devotee of murugan in a ritual procession for ramanujan a scholar like swaminatha iyer was only discovering what was already present to others in tamil culture this recognition did not hold ramanujan back from making such claims that certain texts were lost or ignored in tamil literary tradition due to sectarian conflicts or bias the literary history in other words in this case was read from the perspective of an autobiography that privileged the dominant shaiva monastery let me move to the next uh, 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 you know reading norman cutler's superb essay three moments in the genealogy of tamil literary culture published in sheldon pollock's uh, literary cultures in history in a more attentive and nuanced reading of the literary culture in late 19th century tamil nadu norman cutler issued a warning that it is useful to remind ourselves that the literary culture we come to know via swaminatha iyer's autobiography was a preserve of a limited segment of tamil population a shift in analysis from the history of literature to literary cultures in history enabled such a qualified reading of autobiography as representing a particular tamil literary culture and not i quote an omniscient master narrative unquote recognizing the centrality of swaminatha iyer's efforts in recovering and publishing many classical tamil literary texts cutler argued that the literary cultures of such texts largely lay outside of and predated the horizons of the literary world in which swaminatha iyer himself was raised alongside the biography of his teacher meenakshi sundaram pillai swaminatha iyer's autobiography had offered insights into the cultural and literary worlds inhabited by them cutler's insistence throughout the essay that the literary culture that swaminatha iyer participated in shaiva monastery was limited and that his early training there had no connection with the early tamil literary culture to which many classical texts were rooted is a timely reminder against reductionist interpretations of 19th century tamil literature such as, such exceptions apart the dominant trend in historiography has been the emphasis on rediscovery of tamil classics stemming largely from a particular source it is also important to remember that it is it is uh, norman cutler who reminded us uh, that uh, a large part of autobiography of swaminatha iyer talks about the literary culture uh, uh, of the shaiva uh, monastery at tiruvavadurai now let me go on to the next uh, uh, influential essay uh, of uh, chalapathi titled constructing the canon in an article that addressed the question of tamil literary canon formation the social historian of modern tamil nadu uh, venkata chalapathi has argued that the literary canon is not a given but the product of a specific history noting that a few studies have taken up the question of canon formation in south asia and emphasizing the need to trace the mechanics constitution and implications of canonization venkata chalapathi's article has focused on the ways in which the tamil literary canon came to be redefined in colonial india the religious and didactic literature is considered largely the pre modern literary canon in tamil with works like tirukkural naladiyar kambaramayanam prabandhams and puranams occupying an important place in pedagogy and culture these texts according to him were posited against the newly rediscovered texts during the late 19th and early 20th century like sangam literature and epics like silaparigaram manimegalai and seevaga sindhamani which seem to have brought historic linear time other than secularizing the nature of tamil literary canon displacing in the process the largely religious canon of the pre modern centuries this understanding is based largely on the self perception of swaminatha iyer especially from the much dramatized encounter with selam ramasamy mudaliyar narrated vividly in iyer's autobiography Although Venkata Chalapathi has cited prevailing wider perceptions of what constituted essentials of Tamil literature from such texts like 
வேதநாயகம் பிள்ளை பிரதாபம் முதலியார் சரித்திரம் தமிழ் நாவலர் சரித சரிதை தமிழ் விடு தூது அண்ட் புலவர் புராணம் த டிஃபிகல்டி இன் அசைனிங் இன் சம் ஆஃப் தெம் சோல்லி த ரிலீஜியஸ் கேரக்டர் இஸ் பார்ன் அவுட் பை த ப்ரெசன்ஸ் ஆஃப் சச் நான் ரிலீஜியஸ் டெக்ஸ்ட் லைக் த எயிட் ஆன்தாலஜிஸ் அண்ட் டென் சாங்ஸ் இன் அ கலெக்டிவ் சென்ஸ் அண்ட் ஆப்சன்ஸ் ஆஃப் வைஷ்ணவா கேனன் த நாலாயிர திவ்ய பிரபந்தம் வெங்கடாஜலபதி இஸ் கன்சர்ன் அபவுட் வெதர் a non sectarian tamil canon existed in pre modern times and the nature of such canon if it did exist is a contentious hypothetical premise in the tamil literary historiography let me take recourse to norman cutler uh, uh, on this and present to you what cutler had to say on this issue i quote cutler how closely are religious sectarianism and literary culture intertwined on the one hand sangam poetry is often described as secular on the other the canonical poems of the vaishnava and shaiva saints and the theologically oriented commentaries on the vaishnava poems were clearly produced in a sectarian context and have played a major role in the formation and maintenance of sectarian identity unquote so the alleged divide between religion and secularity sacred and historic linear time played out in the historical process of literary canon formation furthermore the centrality of print in engendering the change is highlighted by venkata chalapati from the perception of the editors of classics who felt the urgency to save the text from them being uh, palm leaves situated at the intersection of orientalism and social contradictions in tamil society the newly rediscovered literary canon was anticipated and appropriated by the non brahman movement in contesting the claims of the superiority of sanskrit and uh, brahmin domination moving away from such uh, rigid distinctions like religion and secularity recent studies have pointed out the transformation and reconfiguration of saiva religion in tamil nadu during the modern period and its relationship with the dravidian movement this is in contrast to the earlier strand of historiography that attempted to point out the secular rationalist and anti caste character of the dravidian movement in particular of the self respect movement launched by ev ramasamy underplaying in the process the continuities with the neo shaivite origins and subsequent interactions with different strands of dravidian politics even strictly within the histories of tamil language and literature the alleged divide between religion and secular is a complicated issue characterizing the term employed by venkata chalapathy as somewhat misleading uh, david shulman contends that a large percentage of the 17th and 18th century tamil literary text in short journals were secular in nature and addressed to regional and local patterns and kings nor was tamil literature secularized at the turn of the 20th century but shulman suggest that merely one older and outmoded mythology was replaced with the newer one notwithstanding such criticism shulman speculates that there was a hiatus of a little more than a century between the time when sangam texts were current and the moment when they had to be rediscovered this is from uh, uh, shulman's wonderful book uh, uh, biography a uh, tamil uh, biography further shulman disagrees with eva wilden and my work in the following terms i quote david shulman here i think that wilden's conclusion that by the early 19th century the bulk of early tamil literature had faded away from common consciousness may be overstated whose consciousness are we talking about how common was it a recent study by v rajesh goes to the other extreme of claiming that the so called recovery has been over emphasized unquote it appears that shulman takes a middle ground in this historiographical debate between rediscovery and continuity arguments let me now move on to the next text eva wilden Uh, uh an interesting uh, uh work title manuscript print and memory relics of the sangam in tamil nadu delving into the history of transmission of sangam text in tamil literary tradition eva wilden argues that the classical corpus was available for scholarly study and quotation up to the 17th century with a emphasis shifting towards text like tirukkural and other devotional literature she further opines that the sangam poems were increasingly marginalized and then virtually forgotten although there existed separate strands of the transmission of manuscripts 
After carefully examining the layers of transmission of the classical Sangam text, Wilden is of the opinion that the state of knowledge of text presented in Swamina Daya's autobiography is accurate. In general, the emphasis seems to be the acceptance of the view that the classical Sangam poems were rediscovered during the late 19th century, implying that the texts were marginalized or forgotten earlier. For example, Wilden writes, I quote, virtually fallen into oblivion by the end of the 19th century, they were rediscovered in the wake of the newly strengthening Tamil national consciousness and the gradual emancipation from colonial rule and were edited, commented upon, and re-included into the canon of Tamil literature." Unquote. So uh, this is uh, Wilden's uh, take on uh, the 19th century reconstitution of uh, uh, Sangam classics. Let me now move on to uh, the uh, final text, Herman Tikan, a controversial Dutch Indologist who also dates the Sangam uh, literature to uh, the early modern period. Uh, uh, his essay, Blaming the Brahmins, Text Lost and Found in Tamil Literary History, published in Studies in History. Critiquing the reasons attributed for the marginalization of Sangam text in the early modern period in literary historiography, Tikan has argued that the classical literary tradition is not totally lost and that to speak of a lost tradition is clearly an exaggeration. For Tikan, the 19th century political climate in Madras presidency, especially the rise of the non-Brahmin movement, shaped the consciousness and attitudes towards the Tamil culture and literature, where the reasons for the supposedly lost classical literary tradition were attributed to the Brahmins and Brahminical Hinduism. Other than vilifying the Brahmins, the Tamil literary historiography also exaggerated that there was a lost tradition of Sangam. Tikan has claimed that, I quote, for most texts, manuscripts were still available, and more importantly, the particular poetic tradition was visibly present in Tamil text well into the 18th century, and that the tradition was never lost, unquote. In critiquing the literary historiography that attributed the Brahmin agency for the marginalization of classical Tamil Sangam tradition in Tamil Nadu, Tikan not only claimed that the tradition was not lost, but pointed out to show that, I quote, the writing of literary histories of Tamil could do uh, with a little less drama, passion, and politics, unquote. The, the manuscript turn in literary history exemplified in the works of Eva Wilden and the team of researchers at the Center for the Study of Manuscript Cultures at the University of Hamburg, Germany, is a significant development in contemporary Tamil studies. Examining the palm leaf manuscripts as objects in their own light, uh, these studies have thrown light on the cultural history of text. Such an approach offers a potential for a new kind of intellectual and cultural history by posing questions related to the architecture and ecology of text as much as throwing light on their content. Now, let me sum up then uh, the historiographical perspectives on rediscovery. Number one, it emphasized the discontinuity in classical literary tradition from the 16th to the mid 19th century, as exemplified in the works of uh, Czech Tamil scholar Kamil Zwelabil, A.K. Ramanujan, Venkata Chalapati, and Norman Cutler. Secondly, it highlighted the dramatic rediscovery of classics during the 19th century. And finally, uh, this strand of historiography, while recounting uh, the reproduction as uh, reproduction of ancient Tamil literature as rediscovery, focused on a few selective texts and, uh, and, and individuals. So uh, now let me move to the second part of my presentation where I will talk about uh, the need to move from uh, this rediscovery to uh, the idea of reproduction. And that also means that we open up uh, and you know, expand uh, the uh, nature of sources that uh, need to be uh, consulted, you know, uh, no doubt, uh, you know, the uh, autobiography of Swaminathan Iyer is uh, uh, still a useful, um, useful, uh, you know, uh, text. But uh, we should also look at the early modern sources and also the 19th century, uh, uh, you know, archives and other records. 
while the historiography on reproduction of Sangam literature during the late 19th and early 20th century focused on the lives of editors and the role of print, the sources for study ranged from personal accounts of the editors of classics to the early printed editions. Such studies based on the reading of a particular set of sources explain the social history of the reproduction of text. While it theorized the reproduction as rediscovery, the arguments were largely based on the self-perception of the editors of Tamil literary tradition themselves and the state of Tamil literary scholarship during the 19th century. The rediscovery argument has also been dramatized largely due to the perceived preservative aspect of print in the light of the supposedly ever decaying manuscript tradition culminating in the 19th century. One of the issues ignored in this historiographical understanding has been the transmission of text in the early modern period into the 19th century. What we term the manuscript turn in historiography of reproduction of classics in recent times has raised new questions by examining the palm leaf manuscripts of uh, uh, palm leaf manuscript text as objects of study. By focusing on the manuscript as a source of study, the recent trend in historiography has addressed questions of the cultural ecology of text and its transmission in the scribal scholarly tradition. Did this change in approach based on the examination of new set of sources alter the historiographical position on the reproduction of Sangam text during the late 19th century? While the manuscript copies have survived, the tradition was largely marginalized and in some cases forgotten. The argument is still in favor of rediscovery, although it has brought, to, brought into light the much needed histories of transmission by focusing on the study of manuscripts. One of the ways to respond to the historiographical position on rediscovery is to examine the diversity of sources going beyond the early printed editions of classics, writings of the early editors and palm leaf manuscripts that constituted the source for the early printed editions. The early colonial archive is one such fertile ground to study this history. Drawing on from Zwellebel's uh, writings, Thomas Trotman observed, that the, observed the following on the College of Fort St. George established in Madras in 1812. I quote Trotman here, it was at the college indeed that the process of recovering and preparing the first printed editions of Tamil classics of ancient and medieval times was initiated, unquote. Further, I quote, it is a great pity that we have only a sketchy and imperfect knowledge of this collection. The reconstruction of its content is a great desideratum for advancing our knowledge of the Tamil Renaissance." Unquote. The college maintained a library, but we could not trace the nature of book and manuscript collection due to lack of reliable catalog. But nevertheless, the Mackenzie's collections, as well as the records of the College of Fort St. George is a fertile terrain to examine the nature of uh, the manuscript collections and the efforts uh, made during the early 19th century uh, uh, on the Tamil uh, literary front. Now, let me uh, talk about uh, Mackenzie's uh, you know, collections a bit. Uh, one of the underexplored sources in dealing with the late 18th and early 19th century context is the catalog of books collected by Mackenzie from various monasteries in South India. One such collection titled Local History has been found in Walter Elliott papers at the British Library. It remains un unclear how a small part of Mackenzie collection landed in Walter Elliott's private papers. However, in this collection, we discovered a few catalogs of Tamil literary works compiled by the collector himself from palm leaf manuscripts. One such catalog was titled List of Eminent Tamil Authors and of Books. Um, it contains 11 sections in which a detailed list of Tamil literary and grammatical works has been presented with a short description of each work. The text referred to in the catalog range from ancient Tamil grammar, Polkapiyam, the 18 minor works or Padinen Pirkanakki, the Tirukkural, to medieval grammatical and literary works. It is true that what we call Sangam literature, that is, uh, the eight anthologies and 10 songs, Ettu Togai and Patu Patu, uh, are absent in the list. But the mere fact that such catalogs were collected by surveyors during the early 19th century holds potential for further investigation in this archive. That is not the only uh, you know, source. There are many other catalogs that were 
presented in the uh, private papers of the colonial administrators. In the Walter Eliot papers at the British Library, we found a few other catalogs and works collected by Mackenzie, like the rough copy of an account of Tamil literature with list of various works, the birth and history of Avayar, the legend of poetess birth, which await investigation along with Mackenzie's papers at the Government Oriental Manuscript Library in Madras. The collection of Mackenzie from the Jain Monastery at Sittamur, titled a catalog of Jain books in possession of the head of Jain Mutt at Sittamur, has detailed uh, the literary works that were preserved in the Jaina institutions. Collected by one J. Napavu, from whom Mackenzie seems to have obtained a copy of the catalog, it gives the list of Tamil literary and grammatical works. Literary works like Sivaga Sindhamani, Tirukkural, Naladiyar, Kalingattabarani, Neelakesi, Sudamani, Udayana Kumara Kaviyam, and Yashodara Kaviyam were included in the list. In another catalog of the Mackenzie's collection titled List of Ancient Poets and Their Works of Dravidian Country, found at Government Oriental Manuscript Library. Works like Nanul, Tirukkural, Sivaga Sindhamani, Naladiyar, Kalingattabarani were included. Now, these catalogs of books compiled by the uh, surveyors in the uh, early late 18th and early 19th century referred above do not provide any information except a descriptive list of literary and grammatical works. Author, chronology, and provenance of these catalogs and the manuscripts listed in them have been difficult to reconstruct from them. The fact that Mackenzie collected and compiled these catalogs indicates that the literary and grammatical works mentioned in them were in circulation and preservation by, early 18, by, by the late 18th and early 19th century. The catalogs invoke a variety of Tamil literary and grammatical works. It is true that we do not find any explicit reference to the earlier stratum of Tamil literature, but the legend of Sangam was not totally absent. There are many such catalogs in the early colonial archive that await investigation by scholars. Now, uh, this, uh, you know, uh, there's a possibility, uh, uh, you know, to look into the histories of transmission by examining these, uh, you know, uh, archival uh, material. Also, uh, uh, we must uh, look at uh, the private collections of Pulavars, Kavirayars, and Ubadhyayars of the 19th century. And that uh, histories need to be uh, uh, reconstructed by examining the uh, provenance of palm leaf manuscripts afresh. Here, I would like to remind uh, uh, the recent writings uh, from uh, the team of researchers uh, at the Center for the Study of Manuscript Cultures at uh, the University of Hamburg, uh, Jonas uh, Bulos and Giovanni Cioti. These two scholars uh, working with uh, Eva Wilden uh, uh, examined uh, the palm leaf manuscripts uh, uh, of classics used by uh, the uh, editors of uh, classics like Swaminatha here and examined them closely, um, um, you know, uh, to tell us the cultural ecology of uh, these text uh, and uh, its uh, and its provenance. Um, the two articles that I'm referring to here, one was published in the Manuscript Cultures uh, a journal that is brought out uh, by the Center uh, for the Study of Manuscript Cultures at the University of Hamburg. Uh, the title of the article is uh, What a Multiple Text Manuscript Can Tell Us About the Tamil Scholarly Tradition, the Case of UVSL 589. And this UVSL 589 is uh, a palm leaf manuscript, uh, you know, examined from UV Swaminatha Iyer's uh, library in Madras. Similarly, Jonas is a fascinating article, a uh, fascinating essay that he presented uh, um, at the 10th NET uh, Tamil workshop in Pondicherry in 2018, is titled Mailai Anna Sami, a 19th century Tamil scribe and his manuscript collection. Such studies, uh, uh, you know, offers a promise to uh, uh, look at uh, the histories of uh, the reproduction of uh, classics uh, during the uh, 18th and 19th century afresh. Now, in the preface to the first printed editions of Sangam Literary Works, editors uh, like Swaminatha Iyer noted down the names of these poets who gave him the palm leaf manuscripts. Swaminatha Iyer toured extensively uh, uh, Tamil Nadu 
and collected palm leaf manuscripts from Pulavars, Kavirayars, and Ubadhyayas. Consider, for example, the following information on the collection of palm leaf manuscripts of one such poet from the autobiography of Swaminathaya. I quote, there was a private library at the house of Ishwaramurthy Pillai. It was their ancestral home. They opened the door of their private library for me. I was taken by surprise when I saw it. Did the Tamil Sangam in those days kept the manuscripts in this fashion? I wondered. The manuscripts were arranged and maintained in order. Even the individual manuscripts were typed properly. There was no dust, no insect. Manuscripts never struck with each other. The library appeared like a Tamil temple for Tamil goddess." Unquote. As far as literary histories of 19th century Tamil Nadu are concerned, we do not get any information or references to the life histories of these Kavirayars who seem to have had a distinctive literary culture beyond the orbit of formal sectarian monasteries. Now, let me sum up. The historiography on the 19th century reproduction of Sangam literature has largely tilted in favor of the rediscovery argument with a lack of a convincing demonstration on the part of those who emphasize the continuities in the literary tradition. However, with the manuscript turn in literary studies, greater attention was paid to the text to explain the cultural history of text. Diversifying the sources of study might enable historians to approach these transmission and reproduction histories in a challenging way. Similarly, moving away from binaries, historians need to pose alternate questions that might provoke newer ways to find answers. While the first editorial ventures of Tamil scholars during the 19th and early 20th century enabled the reproduction of classical Tamil literature, recounting such episodes in literary history must go beyond their perceptions. Such a history must examine the role of manuscripts in Tamil literary tradition and literary cultures of poets, teachers, and scholars not necessarily affiliated with the Hindu sectarian monasteries. In a penetrating set of lectures, Sri Lankan Tamil scholar Sivatambi argued that we need to move beyond the pro-establishment versions of literary history, and that required whether we have brought in all the available sources. The historiographical position on the rediscovery of classical Tamil literature can be further questioned by bringing the oral sources, especially folk narratives and popular stories from various parts of Tamil Nadu. Such narratives and stories need not have to be an oral telling of Sangam literature, but legends, poets, and events remembered and retold in popular traditions. By examining multiple sources, our understanding of Tamil literary history will undergo a radical transformation. So I will end my talk here. These are uh, the references. Thank you very much. Arijit. Thank you, Professor, for this wonderful talk. It was a very enlightening talk. So I would now open the floor for questions. I have a question, if I may, uh, Dr. Vinkitz Ramanyam. Yeah, please. Uh, yeah. I, since I'm working on uh, Shaiva monasteries in early medieval India, so I know it's not directly linked to your talk, but, you know, you say that there's a hiatus between, you know, of 100 years where these were works like the Sangam literature were being studied or copied or uh, commented upon, et cetera, et cetera, and their so-called rediscovery. And in the meanwhile, they were also being housed in so-called Sheva, or not so-called, but Sheva monastic, uh, monasteries. Uh, what kind of systems were in place in these Sheva monasteries? Where were they? Uh, which kind of Vedic schools were they affiliated to? And... Uh, they and and uh, why were they not privileging uh, Tamil uh, Sangam literature uh, in uh, contrast to these uh, Shaiva Agams and other uh, Shaiva? Uh, probably, I think Shaiva Siddhantika texts such as Tattva Prakash, etc. I assume that is what they were privileging. So, uh, these are just some of the questions that just you know occurred to me while I was listening to you. 
yeah uh, thank you so much um the monasteries that i am referring to or uh, the shaiva siddhanta monasteries uh, in tamil nadu um kathleen eva copy dryer has uh, written a wonderful phd thesis examining the uh, the culture and uh, you know the history of these uh, uh, shaiva monasteries uh, in in tamil nadu uh, um now the reason for not uh, you know uh, privileging the the, the classics so, there's a long history of uh, uh, you know the shaivite appropriation of uh, uh, tamil literary past going back to the early medieval times in fact the commentary to the early medieval grammar um, you know uh, irena ragapuru uh, dated to uh, the uh, 7th 8th century uh, talks about the legend of sangam and uh, Uh, it was argued that uh, lord shiva himself was uh, a participant in other words uh, the story indicates that there is a long history of equation of uh, you know the shaivite uh, imaginary with uh, tamil literature uh, in tamil literary tradition and uh, this uh, tradition the earlier tradition got consolidated uh, uh, with the with the setting up of uh, the uh, you know the shaiva siddhanta monasteries uh in the medieval times and uh, uh but again that doesn't uh, adequately explain uh, the marginalization of uh, you know these uh, early tamil poetry in these uh, centers uh, one of the arguments presented by scholars is that uh, these texts were you know the secu- sec- uh, were secular in nature uh, you know uh, these were you know the love poems and the bardic poetry the war poems and so on and less to do with uh, you know uh, the uh, the tamil shaiva uh, uh, you know culture that emerged from uh, the bhakti tradition uh, from the early modern period so this uh, early medieval period so this is uh, been cited as a reason by some scholars for you know uh, the marginalization of these uh, text but the monasteries did maintain uh, in their libraries uh, uh, you know the manuscript copies of uh, uh, classics uh, tapped by the early editors of classics when they were printing them uh, thank you so much thank you uh, any other questions please go ahead i would like to ask one if i may yes so please. i mean so how do you position your uh, rediscovery i mean the rediscovery argument which you were talking about vis-a-vis the initial colonial interactions i mean so this whole edifice of rediscovery stems out from the colonial you know colonial construct or rather i would say the colonial obsession with uh, antiquarian texts which pollock highlights as you know europe's effort for uh, uh, it's a uh, its quest for uh, its vanquishing spirituality in its literally culture work so how do you position this argument vis we i mean so to say swaminathan i for that instance was also a product of this age sir for that matter so how do you position this rediscovery argument with uh, the initial colonial interactions sir yes thank you so much well um, colonialism was a dominant template there is no denial of uh, the fact uh, of the colonial presence uh, and uh, if we look at uh, the cycles of uh, you know investment uh, on uh, tamil literary past uh, it starts with uh, what trotman calls uh, you know the madras school of orientalism uh, going back to uh, the early 19th century when the college of poets and george was set up and uh, the enthusiasm displayed by uh, f w elis uh, in uh, collecting uh, you know the tamil uh, uh, manuscripts uh, and publishing uh, grammars and dictionaries back then so uh, the colonial uh, investment in uh, you know in uh, learning the language and uh, literature was very much uh, there from the early 19th uh, uh, century and uh, the college of folks and george appointed uh, you know people to go around uh, tamil nadu in search of uh, palm leaf manuscripts of uh, uh, the catholic uh, the jesuit missionary cj beski 
and uh, you know so uh, uh, so um, it would be interesting to you know look at uh, uh, the uh, the trajectory of uh, uh, the collections of the college um, and the impact it had on uh, uh, on on you know the print and publishing history of the 19th century uh, tamil world uh, uh, scholars like professor ar venkata chalapati have been working on this for a while uh while this been the case in the early uh, phase that is during the uh, early 19th century uh from uh, you know uh, from the mid 19th century onwards there has been uh, you know uh, there, there has been a withdrawal on the part of colonial state uh, from investing on these uh, issues largely because you know the ideology of the colonial state was also changing and so on so that uh, swamina dayar uh had to resort to a subscription system you know an advanced subscription system to bring out some of these editions of classics in print and uh, he petitioned the colonial government to uh, you know uh, to offer a grant uh, in this uh, effort and uh, after getting you know recommendation letters from european scholars the colonial state uh, at the turn of the 20th century ultimately recognized uh, the effort of swamina dayar and uh, you know and uh, awarded uh, a monetary grant uh, very uh, limited grant uh, you know uh, for his efforts uh, so so you know uh, so that's that's uh, uh, the colonial as far as the colonial state and its uh, you know and its uh, investment in uh, tamil in the rediscovery of uh, classics is concerned but largely it was the effort of uh, you know the uh, the indigenous tamil scholars thank you sir so if there are no more questions i presume then we end on this note on a very happy note i should say so thank you for all of us for joining us thank you all the uh, professors who are there in this call and thank you for the people audience who have joined us on facebook so keep checking our page on facebook for uh, next updates on our weekly seminars thank you all thank you very much thank you so much thank you right goodbye thank you.